Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Rob. I am so happy to be back at Shahi, but I also forgot how every morning feels earlier, even though I get up at the same time. So um, I'm, I'm just feeling that this morning. Are you feeling that this morning? Yes. I, I'm feeling it this morning. It's always on Wednesday that I feel it. So. Um, I'm thrilled to be back at Shehi, and I'm really thrilled that uh, Mr. Harry asked me to come speak at, or uh, to come be at Chamberfest. When he called me first, back, I don't know, in the winter or spring, he said to me, I need you to come and either direct the middle school choir or coach at Chamberfest. And I loved the middle school choir. I would have ha happily done either one but I was secretly rooting for Chamberfest. <laughs> so when he asked me to coach for Chamberfest, then I was, I was very excited. I had a little hand in the beginning of this program uh, 10 years ago, and I just I think it's a really, uh, really great addition to the Chehi program because it offers you a chance to maybe grow a little deeper in your musicality and also in your walk with the Lord. So I love this program a lot. And I was even more happy when I found out that my good friend Clark Potter would be here um, as the guest artist. So, um, so I'm just thrilled to be here, uh, which uh, is something after 41 years, I have to say. It's uh, mm -hmm. something to still be thrilled to be here. I'm also, uh, I want to give special thanks to my chamber group, who has been just a delight to work with this week. And um, they've made my work very much easier, and I, I appreciate that so much. Um, I'm really enjoy enjoying this week. I hope you are, too. Are you enjoying this week? Good, 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 good. So I've been looking forward to sharing uh, with you this morning for quite some time, which um, when you look at my topic, you might think, but Mr. Raleigh, that's kind of a downer. And you're right, it is. It is. It's a downer. But... Um, God chooses to teach us so many things during times of trouble that I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that today. And quite frankly, it's where I've been for about three months now. I call it walking through the valley of the shadow. And I've been doing that now for three months. I know some of you have been too. So uh, I just thought it would be a good place to spend a little time today. I will say that the path forward for me looks a little brighter today than it did at the beginning, and that's a good thing. This is a road that I know really well because I've walked it lots of times. And there's a lot that I don't know, but what I do know, I want to share with you today so that if you have to walk this road, you have a reference point, something to think about. So anyway, it was on April 5th at about 6.30 in the morning, Friday morning, that I received the phone call from my good friend Beth White in Kenya. Now, can we all agree that there aren't very many good phone calls that come at 6.30 in the morning? It's usually not good news, right? And it wasn't. On the other end of the line, I heard these words. Floyd, I have terrible news for you. Wes died in the night. So she went on to tell me all the particulars, what happened, all those sorts of things. And honestly, I did not remember those details until later on in the day. All I was thinking about was, this can't be possible. The news I received yesterday, Thursday, the day before, was so good. What about his wife? What about Cindy? What about the kids? How am I going to tell Janet, my wife, and my own kids? And why, God? Why? But the fact was, Wes was gone. Gone from this world. So my elder brother, my confidant, my mentor, pastor of my heart, gone. So, when grief like that hits you, 
It's like an earthquake in your soul. You lose your balance. You need to find some solid ground. Where do you find it? Where do you find that solid ground? Well, we know we find it in Jesus, right? But I like to say you find the solid ground in what you know to be true. Many of you have heard me say, your feelings aren't as important as you think they are, right? That's because if we are governed by our feelings, at a time like this, we're never going to find the solid ground that we need. You need to trust to what you know. So what do I know? I, there's a lot I don't know, first of all. A lot I don't know. But what do I know? I know that God loves me. Who are Sean's, counsel, Sean's counselees? All right. I know that Sean picked this verse uh, as your hall verse, I think, this, this week. Um, a few of you, I had the privilege of conducting a few of you last summer in chamber choir, first week of chamber choir, in the really beautiful setting that Stephen Paulus wrote of these words. I'm not going to read them all for you. You can read them yourself. Besides, if I read them, I'll break down probably. So you read them. But the very end is what I want you to notice. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. So I know that God loves me. And I know that He understands that I am human and that part of that is the temporary nature of my life. The fact that humans are only around for a little while, right? And there's this great verse in Isaiah, again in Isaiah. And I could read it for you, but I'd rather have it sung for you. So I have this little clip from Brahms' great work, the, the German Requiem. The, we refer to it as the Brahms Requiem or the German Requiem. This is the second movement of it. You know, if you're a musical purist, I apologize to you. You are used to hearing this in an orchestrated fashion, right? Big orchestra, big choir. And I'm going to play it for you um, in another way that Brahms also wrote it. He wrote it with a, a piano four hands accompaniment. And um, so I'm going to play that version for you. And I'm also going to play it, once again, begging your apologies. Uh, it, in the uh, great translation, English translation, done by the great conductor Robert Shaw. So just, I'm just going to play about a minute of it. If I can get my machine to work. Yeah, there we go.
Isn't that a great way of, of hearing that scripture right there? So God knows that we are human and that uh, our lives don't last forever. He also knows, or he also told his disciples right before he was about to be crucified. He said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. And then later on in that chapter, chapter 16 of John, he says these words, and I think these are key to our, what we're talking about today. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And then there's this verse at the very end of the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, that I think is key to realizing that God understands our humanity. When he says, or when Paul says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. He knows that I don't see things on this side of eternity, correctly. I only see shadows of what his will is, of what his plan is. He knows this. During Lent this year, 40 days of Lent, I did a little study um, using a book by the British poet Malcolm Geith. How many of you know who Malcolm Geith is? You should know Malcolm Geith. You should know who Malcolm Geith is. And this, uh, this little book called Word in the Wilderness gives you a poem every day for Lent. And sometimes they're Malcolm's poems, and sometimes they're poems of other people. And one day I encountered a poem in this book that I think really illustrates the fact that we don't see things clearly on this side of eternity. And I'd like to read that poem for you. It's called Death is Birth. And it is by a poet uh, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare's, John Davies, but we don't hear very, very much about him. I think he was more better known as a politician during his time, but he was also a poet. So I'd like to just read this for you. The first life in the mother's womb is spent, where she her nursing power doth only use, where when she finds defect of nourishment, she expels her body and this world she views. This we call birth, but if the child could speak, he death would call it, and of nature plain that she would thrust him out naked and weak, and in his passage pinch him with such pain. Yet out he comes, and in this world is placed, where all his senses in perfection be, where he finds flowers to smell and fruits to taste, and sounds to hear and sundry forms to see. When he hath passed some time upon this stage, his reason then a little seems to wake, which, though the spring, when sense doth fade with age, yet can she hear no perfect practice make. Then doth the aspiring soul the body leave, which we call death. But were it known to all what life our souls do by this death receive, Men would it birth or jail delivery call. In this third life, reason will be so bright as that her spark will like the sunbeams shine and shall of God enjoy the real sight, being still increased by influence divine. When I think of Wesley today, I think of these last two stanzas, what he's seeing, what he's feeling in heaven doesn't make me miss him any less, but may, it helps me to have some joy in the process of missing him. It gives me great comfort to know that he has been here himself. I think it's 
so wonderful that God gives us this story in, uh, in the Gospels. The story of Jesus and his friend Lazarus and how his friend dies, he goes to mourn with the sisters, with Mary and with Martha, and they take him to the tomb, tomb and at the very end of the passage, there's these two words, which I think you mentioned last night. Jesus wept. Those two words that say so much, that tell us that he took part in our mourning and in our grief. To me, that's a great comfort to know that he has been here himself. Number four, he can take my questions. Do you think it's okay to question God? I think that the Bible shows us so many of examples of how, it's, how and why it's necessary to bring our questions to God. Through my most recent grief journey, I've been helped by this book. Now, I'm not, I don't know how to say Mark's last name. I'm going to try Vrogop. It doesn't make sense to me. I need him to say it for me. But Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy is the story of Mark and his wife's journey through grief after the stillbirth of their daughter, Sylvia. So the pregnancy had gone fine. No indications of any problems at all. They got to just before the delivery date. Suddenly his wife realized baby wasn't moving anymore. Baby was born dead. And that just sent them, of course, as it sends all of us into a spiral of emotions and a spiral of grief. And Mark found his comfort in what he calls the grace of lament in Scripture. I call it the discipline of lament because I believe that this is the way that God intends for us to deal with our grief. So he spells out four steps to a biblical lament. He says, first, we turn and we cry out to God. It's almost a physical thing, just like I did when I found out that Wes had died. Why God? Why? But we're turning to God. So instead of turning inward and only looking at me and, and what I feel, I'm taking that and giving it to God. Then we complain. Yes, we complain to God. Carefully. Humbly. But we complain. We bring our complaint to God. Then we ask. We make a request. And then there's a turning point always in a biblical lament. And that turning point usually happens with one of three words. But and, or yet. And if you look in these biblical, in these laments, particularly the lament psalms, do you know that, it depends who you talk to, but between a third and a half of the psalms, the largest book in the Bible, between a third and a half of them are lament psalms that follow this pattern in one way or another. At that turning point, we begin to trust we express our faith, our praise to God. Sometimes we rehearse the good things that God has done for us in the past. Many times we look forward to the good things that God will do for us in the future. So we turn, we complain, we ask, and we trust. I'd like to use Psalm 13 to show you what, what he means by that. I think that the psalmist, I think it was David in this case, combines turning and complaining, and you'll see that uh, many times in, uh, in, in these psalms, but I think he kind of combines that here. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? 
How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? So these are rhetorical questions, right? These are not real questions. He's, he's, compl he's complaining to God. You're taking too long, Lord. You're taking too long. Here's where the real request is. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Turning, complaining, asking, and trusting. So lament is not a once and done action. When you're walking through grief, you will lament over a period of time. No set period of time, sorry to tell you. Different for everybody. Just as grief is ongoing, lament is ongoing. But lament helps us to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It gives us progress. It gives us a way to progress through that valley. Lament gives us a place to take our grief. Something to do with all of those emotions. Lament gives us space for our feelings. I've already said to you, your feelings aren't as important as you think they are. But they are important. They're just not as important as we sometimes think they are. Lament turns our hearts toward God. It's very, really important when you're going through something like this that you don't continually turn inward, but that you allow yourself to turn outward toward God. Lament reminds us of God's goodness. And maybe most importantly, lament allows us to exchange our sorrows for hope. Number five, I know that he has my best in mind. Now, this next verse I'm going to show you from Jeremiah, I think sometimes is used out of context. Let's remember what the context is. The people of Israel have been sent in exile in Babylon. Jerusalem has been utterly destroyed. It is a war zone. In fact, it's either in Jeremiah or Lamentations that it's described for us that the stones of the temple are piled in rubble at the ends of the streets. And the gold that coated those stones has melted and is in the cracks in the road. That people don't have enough to eat. Children don't have enough to eat. And people are in desperate, desperate straits. And then Jeremiah gives them this word from the Lord. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. So I think it's totally appropriate to apply this to a moment of grief and sorrow in your life. We tend to apply it to things like your college choice and, you know, uh, which house I should buy and, and things like that. But I think it's appropriate when your life is in shattered ruins, like Jerusalem was in shattered ruins, to apply this verse. He has your best in mind. Number six. He will get me through this and safely to the other side. Doesn't feel like it at first, but he will. We often use Psalm 23 to comfort us at these kinds of times, right? But I think we miss a point here in uh, the fourth verse. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Grief is something that you get through, that you walk through. Sometimes the steps are baby steps. It doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere. 
but you're going to get through it. He's going to bring you through it. And then there's this great verse from Philippians 1. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I've used this verse many times in my life when I've thought, oh my goodness, God, what are you doing? He's going to get me through it. He's going to get you through it. So loss wears many faces. Today I'm talking about the death of my good friend. But loss wears many, many faces. And here are some of them. It's not an exhaustive list. But my guess is you can relate to some of these things. Something here relates to you. Loss wears many faces. And when we experience loss, we experience grief. But grief is what I call the chameleon emotion. Meaning that my grief today does not look like my grief did yesterday and probably won't look like my grief tomorrow. And my grief and my grief process does not probably look like your grief and your grief process. Because all of these things are a part of grieving. A valid part of grieving. Sometimes we judge people when we watch them go through grief. We judge them for a couple of reasons. Because the emotions they feel are intense and that embarrasses us. But sometimes we think the emotions they feel are inappropriate. All of these things are appropriate reactions to grief. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. It's a certainty. I know that there are some people here who have been fortunate enough to live this long in life and you haven't suffered a significant loss. I am so happy for you. But I have to remind you that this is a temporary state of affairs. And even if you are one of those people, you know somebody who has walked this road. You do. For some of you, talking about this brings up really tough moments from your life. And I'm sorry that you've had to experience tough things at this age. There are people here, including myself, who'd love to sit down with you and talk with you and pray with you. Or just listen to you talk about your grief road and how you're walking it and what you're feeling. We'd love to do that. So please, please, please take advantage of the people around you. What will be your anchor when the tsunami of grief hits you? The tsunami of all those emotions, that feeling of loss of balance. What will be your anchor? Cling to the things you know. He loves you. He understands your humanity. He has been there himself. He can take your questions. He has your best in mind. He will take you safely through this to the other side. Let's take comfort from these words in Lamentations 3. And I know that Graham has chosen one of these kind of as the theme of the summer. But I, I was thinking of it before I knew that. So in Lamentations 3, first of all, Jeremiah, or whoever wrote Lamentations, probably Jeremiah, rehearses his own grief. And he says some pretty intense stuff. I mean, he's in a bad way. And so he goes through that all the way down to this verse, where he dares to begin to hope. And it starts with the word, but. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. So he's daring to hope, but then he lapses back into the just the mind-blowing, mind-boggling emotions of grief for a moment. And he goes on a bit more. But later on in the chapter, he realizes that God is going to fight for him. So in verse 55, he says, I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ear to my cry for help. You came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. You have taken up my cause, O Lord. You have redeemed my life. Let's take comfort in those words, my friends. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for being with us in the times of joy. But like Ecclesiastes 7 says at the beginning of the chapter, it is better to be in the house of mourning than in the house of feasting. Because it is in the house of mourning where you teach us so many important lessons about you, about your love for us. Lord, I pray that you would be with these students in those moments in their lives. Give them plenty of moments of joy, plenty of moments of good things. But when the inevitable moments of grief and sorrow come, help them to turn to you. And please turn their grief into hope and back into joy. In Jesus' name, amen.